you have four hours to write it tomorrow from eight to 12, and you're not going to be able to upload any external files. You're just going to submit the Samplify doc. So copy pasting into it should be okay, however. I think my prof said tables are fine, as well as uh, text, but you shouldn't really be writing text software. Maybe you can paste the images. It depends on the exam. But if you copy an image to your clipboard, so if you like just control C or command C elsewhere, and then paste it in using right click and then paste, you should be able to put an image in there. If you want to take a screenshot, here's some cool tricks. If you're on Mac, you can press instead of command shift four for like the normal screenshot, so it's like hold down control as well, and it auto gets copied to your clipboard. So you can paste the image directly, or you can hit uh, Windows T shift F if you're using Windows. Uh, don't worry yourself in Word. You know, I did it once, really bad. Your word count will be way over, <laughs> and then your formatting will get messed up. So there really is no advantage to writing in Word. It also saves automatically in Exemplify, so IT can recover yourself if your computer uh, doesn't work during the exam. So this is not the official mark breakdown. I think my prof put something like this on the board, but like, don't take it out of these values. Totally we estimated it. The three main questions that are going to be examined on the exam. First one is um, how well you can identify the problem and analyze how the firm is doing. So what's the crux of the case? How are we performing the market? And then the next one is how will we fit in terms of uh, alignment and with our strategy, both internally and externally. Finally, we want to look at our strategic choices. So that's part of the implementation or action plan, as well as how effective our previous decisions were. Uh, pretty similar to the 24. You don't have to use every framework here. Uh, you're probably going to lose marks if you do that. But it makes more sense for you to answer the exam questions really well, putting your words appropriately for it. So I suggest you split your time like this. Uh, depends on your reading speed as well. But before you start, check if you can paste some images. Then you can maybe make some diagrams at the end. But don't save that to the end. If you know you can do it and get some bonus marks for it, then check at the beginning. Ask the proctor or right click and try to paste in an image. Uh, spent the first 30 minutes uh, reading the case, understanding the key points. Next 45, you should split on area one here. So understanding the problem and anal analyzing how well the firm is performing. Afterwards, spend around an hour putting together your strategy triangle on the diamond E, uh, as well as your internal and external frameworks. Determine how well the fit is, and then you can propose some solutions. I think it's actually a good idea to sit there for a bit, uh, maybe grab a piece of paper and brainstorm everything you can possibly do, because it's in this 15 minutes that you can really come up with something that might set you apart once you flesh it out for the following hour, which is area three, um, strategize, assess, and implement. Finally, for the last 30 minutes, uh, obviously flex time, but if you finish, then you could uh, build some diagrams, put together something on PowerPoint, or just proofread it and make it more cohesive. So let's talk about some core concepts in frameworks, because I feel like they gave us a lot of reading, but didn't really teach us. We had some lecture slides. But the most important thing regarding strategy is value. So what is value? Well, it's kind of like what benefit you create. So the definition of economic value is the difference between willingness to pay or like theoretically the most you could charge a customer for your product minus your cost of producing it. So it's like this entire red section here, right? Bottom here is cost. At the top is willingness to pay. Um, it, value can also refer to non-monetary benefits. So, for example, our society works better. I mean, we've done enough sustainability stuff recently. Um, in many cases, the actual challenge comes before determining creation and capture. You want to make sure that you're communicating the actual value, you know, you're trying to provide to the customers in the first place. Otherwise, you may not even have the transaction occur. So there's nothing to capture, nothing to create. Seems like a marketing problem but you want to really understand your value proposition. So what is your value proposition? Well, it's kind of why your customer should choose your product and how they benefit from it. For example, for FedEx, um, their value proposition is to help you manage your home deliveries. So if we think of like value-driven strategy, there's four key parts of any transaction. Uh, you probably know two and three, but one and four you should know as well. Willingness to pay is theoretically the highest price a customer will pay for what you provide. So let's say you're at like uh, a ball game and you're trying to buy a hot dog. Given that there's no other uh, food stands available, you could probably charge like $25, $30 for a hot dog 
if people are starving, they're keeping there for six hours, right? So that's theoretically like the absolute high price, which the willingness to pay. But the price they actually charge is like $15 to the hot dog. So the difference between willingness to pay and price here is customer delight or the value captured by the customer or buyer here. The idea is that they gain some additional value because they could have theoretically paid 30 for like the hot dog, but you only charge them 15. And so they're very happy with that value that they've captured. Now for you as the seller, um, you understand margin, right? So if I'm selling the hot dog for 15, but it costs me like $2 to produce, then I capture $13 of value here. So that's my margin as the firm or hot dog vendor. Finally, we got cost and willingness to sell. Cost is how much you actually pay the supplier for the raw materials of the hot dog, sauce and fun. And the willingness to sell is how much the uh, supplier is willing to accept at a minimum for these raw materials that they provide you. So if it only costs the supplier like 50 cents for all the raw materials of a hot dog, but you're paying them $2, like you're paying a supplier, then the supplier surplus, so the value captured by your supplier here is $1.50. So depending on which role you're taking on in this entire transaction, whether you're the customer or like the main firm who's vending the product or the seller providing the raw materials, um, you might want to take a look at which of these gaps you want to extend. So if we have a look at the value stick, uh, it's very similar to the value creation and capture one here. You'll notice that uh, willingness to pay is at the top with uh, willingness to sell at the bottom. And we have our three sections or gaps in the middle between these price points. Here, it just shows the difference uh, between what is being captured by the buyer and the seller and the total value being created. So there's a couple of different actions we can take uh, or strategies we can apply with respect to value in order to, for example, capture more value as the firm, which is generally our goal in these cases. So one of them is raising the price. Now you're going to charge the customers more. It's pretty simple. You might lose out on sale volume or you might have less customers coming back because they're capturing less value. People are going to be less happy that they have to pay $20 for the hot dog at the ball game instead of 15. You might also lose competitive advantage if you're trying to compete using a strategy that's concerning price. We'll delve into that in the next section. But a good example of raising prices as a strategy is grocery prices today. Willingness to pay is very high because it's a necessity. Everyone needs uh, food to survive. And so you can increase your firm margin by decreasing customer delight. The next one is to raise the willingness to pay. So actually make customers willing to afford uh, a product that costs more, has a higher price. Now this theoretically captures more value for the firm because you can charge a higher price and increase your margin. And also makes the customer potentially happier because they're getting what they perceive or what may actually be a better product um, since the willingness to pay is higher and the price is higher. So both of these segments have expanded. Now the consideration for this is the pricing may be too high. So you might cut out demographics that are price sensitive. And it's a big question. Can you really convince them that you want to sell a better product? A good example of this is Apple. Um, when they release their phones and devices, you know it's the most expensive thing out there. Well, relatively speaking. But since you perceive it to be high quality and there's a pretty cohesive user experience, the willingness to pay is higher. And so Apple has the craziest margins of all of these manufacturers. Now we have to look at costs. One thing we can do is lower our actual cost of our raw materials as like the firm here. So we might choose something cheaper, cheapening out on raw material. Now this might reduce your quality. Uh, it might make your product more inferior if you can't find like an ideal substitute that's uh, just a lower price, which might actually lower willingness to pay and then force you to lower your price because you're not perceived as high quality. But it may be a pretty good choice. So for example, if you are a grocery store again, but you want to be a good guy, you could uh, use a generic brand, like contact the manufacturer directly, cut out the marketing and, I don't know, I don't know Kellogg, General Mills, like the generic brands in the middle and thereby increase your margin. Yet another one is uh, lower the willingness to sell to actually negotiate for better uh, terms from like your supplier by making them more willing to accept like a lower price for the raw material. In this case, you will generally engage in exclusivity or volume purchasing discount. You need to give them some incentive to lower it. And you might actually get inferior raw material. But a good example is uh, this theme here. If you buy all of this supply, then they're probably willing to give you a lower price. So 
if we think about strategic positioning here, you'll notice that it was one of the main points being assessed um, in this exam. You want to mention the generic strategy being used. So there's two main generic strategies, cost leadership and differentiation. In cost leadership, you aim to be the lowest cost producer by maximizing your profit, by offering very low prices to your consumer, uh, while still minimizing your cost. And differentiation, where you try to create a very unique, high quality perceived product that you can charge more for. So when they ask you on the exam, what's your strategic positioning? You say, I'm using this generic strategy probably. Um, and then for extra points, bring up which parts of like this value stick you want to move. So here's what changes for cost leadership. If you're trying to lower based on price, then by offering the lowest cost in the industry, you can capture a larger margin because the cost in the industry is higher than yours, whereas you can price similarly. And for differentiation, if you can price higher but maintain comparable costs, then you still increase your margin and capture above average value. All right, now let's talk a bit more about alignment. I see this in stuff in the chat. Okay, cool. So there are some key components of the strategy triangle you should know. I generally think it's a good idea to start off with a value prop and then see how the rest of the triangle supports it. After all, the value prop sits at the middle of this triangle. So your value prop is really the benefit you're bringing to the customer, right? And how it really compares with competitors. But you want to support it with your three vertices of your triangle. So check if your goals are attainable for the firm, what metrics you can use to measure the success, and uh, how you can modify your core activities and product market focus to achieve those goals. For example, is how your business structured, well organized to support what you're trying to bring to customers? Is it supported by your product market focus? Which is, uh, I'll show you what that looks like later. You're comparing markets and products, really. And in general, when they ask you about strategic alignment, you start with the strategy triangle. Um, and then you move on to some more detailed analysis with internal and external. So here's product market focus. Um, there's four main strategies that we tend to employ based on whether the product or market is new. If it's a new product uh, in an existing market, it's going to be product expansion. For example, adding a new brand of cereal as Kellogg. If it's an existing product with an existing market, then it's penetration problem. So we might want to increase the market share of profit flakes. If it's a new product, a new market, we're basically creating something that new, so it's like diversification. But if it's an existing product to a new market, we're expanding to new market, like bringing, um, I don't know, Apple devices to China in like the early 2010s, for example. And here's the strategy triangle up there. You can see the vertices support the value proposition here. Okay, external frameworks. This part is pretty fast. Uh, we've seen these frameworks like a million times. You probably did them in high school, but I don't think you're going to get extra marks from just filling in case class and populating them because that's kind of the point of the exam to draw implications based on it. It's also very dangerous here because you're probably going to run out of words. Um, please don't go overboard on stating case facts. Rather, look at each of these frameworks. Pick the one that will give you the best insights for each of the sections. So like one key insight, like emphasize the specific threat opportunity or key success factor here. And remember, external analysis is probably like 500 words max after 2,500 words max, because you still have to answer the other three questions. So of course, there's TESOL. Um, I'm not going to go through these, but look at each category, right? And then pick out a strength, uh, sorry, pick out an opportunity or a thread. Uh, they're supported by forces. So you might want to look at in a competitive case where you're trying to differentiate. Uh, I think rivalry among existing competitors and new interests is going to be very high. But if it's a cost leadership case, you might care a bit more about marketing power. Uh, it's a lot of stuff to, to really stand out. Finally, stakeholder analysis. You can compile together a stakeholder register or list to be more organized figure out what groups are at play and group them appropriately, but you might run out of uh, base or text, so you might delete at the end. You can also use a power interest grid here um, to determine how you should actually engage with your different stakeholders. However, might be more of an implementation thing as well. Okay, 
internal. So this is where there's a lot of stuff. Uh, the biggest challenge is finishing the DOM and E. I personally found it to be a really confusing framework, but don't worry, it really isn't that bad. So there's five key components you should look at in terms of management preferences. Uh, it's kind of like what the company wants to do or what they think they want to do. The goals they've set, their values, how open they are to taking on risk. And then it's what the company is able to do, organization and resources. So how is it structured, the processes, what staff do you have? It's like LPO. And then for resources, um, a bit more like finance, what capabilities do we have based on finance, uh, like plans and like operations, a legal team even. And finally, the two things on the right, which are strategy. This is what you're trying to set in this exam, an environment which are the external conditions you've just examined here. So the important thing about the DOM and e is don't write too much about each individual component. In fact, if you're very, very brief with these, I think it's fine because the whole point of the case is to illustrate all of the like uh, sub information. However, you want to really look at the tensions that occur between these individual components and add groups of tension so that you can really wrap up your internal analysis, find misalignment, and find that point, which is the main strategy, right? So this is what you're trying to determine, like in this order, right? Figure out what you need to do with the company to succeed. Um, here, you would look at the strategy and improve it based on the environmental uh, external analysis that you just did. Secondly, you would move to want to do. Determine what they have been trying to do previously. Look at your goals. Does it align with what your strategy says you should be doing based on how to survive or succeed as a company? If not, you might want to change these, right? That might be a misalignment. And finally, look at what you can do as a company. So you're going to want to follow your order um, that you've previously determined of what strategy should I do and what should I try to do? And now how can I do it? Um, do we have the right organization and capabilities and resources to accomplish this? If not, you're going to want to really highlight this and uh, devise a way for achieving these competencies by the time you put together your implementation plan. So yeah, the idea is to really achieve strategic alignment by looking at these three tensions. Now, I know the readings suck, um, but I did them just for you guys. So I'll walk you through the big ideas. Uh, the main intro to the course is What a Strategy by B. Michael Porter. He made up the five courses. The goal is to uh, create a unique and valuable position by using different activities. I don't know, groundbreaking. So you could serve like the few needs of many customers, uh, like Jiffy Lube. They provide, uh, you know, just car maintenance to everybody. Broad needs of few customers. So you can handle all the finances for like, I don't know, a super rich person. Or the broad needs of many in a narrow market. So Farm Boy, which is only in like wealthy, small pockets of cities where people like organic stuff. So you need to make trade-offs to achieve this fit. The three levels of culture you should know. The first one is artifact. So this is kind of what you see here and observe at a very surface level when you encounter a new group. For example, you might think IV culture as artifact is just going to uh, Delilah every Thursday. And then you have the actual espoused beliefs and values. So when you ask the people, what do you actually believe? They're like, oh, our culture believes that, um, I don't know, the case learning method is good, for example. And then basic, basic underlying assumptions, which is what do the people actually believe in? The case method is great because we don't have to do it. All right. So we look at resource analysis next. So uh, it's pretty similar to LPO. Um, we know that there's many categories of resources. For example, you can have a good marketing team, existing campaigns that are going well, I guess. Operation development, finance, like the different verticals in your company. And then next, you might actually want to use this framework, although I don't think it will come up very often. It might be for more like rare resource-based cases. Uh, you want to figure out VRIO for your firm. So does this particular resource or group of resources allow us to respond to external threats and opportunities, thereby capturing value, as we saw in the beginning of this presentation? Uh, is it a rare resource? So do people already have them? Um, if it's rare, is it imitable? Can people gain this resource quickly or is it hard to protect? And finally, say we do have this resource, it's rare and it's imitable. Are we able to actually execute and make the most of this resource through our organization? Next, uh, for management preferences. I don't know why, but the chapter is just about sustainability. Um, 
the goal is be ethical, be socially responsible, consult your management when you're trying to make these decisions and account for their needs, beliefs, context. The beliefs that uh, are really deeply ingrained or frozen preferences and try to act in a responsible manner. And then finally for strategic choices, you might actually want to mention this when uh, the end of your analysis or when you're going to implementation as a caveat, there might be cognitive biases here, like framing the way that it's presented to you. Hindsight, oh, you know, my analysis may not be perfect because the case took place five years ago and I know how it ended up happening. Gambler's fallacy where you think there's like a pattern to random events. Availability where you assume your information is complete or if you're just, you know, very arrogant and overconfident. So there's different types of strategies to uh, mitigate this and strategies that do come up. They might be planned, they might actually be executed or not, or they might be unplanned strategies that you come up as you go. Those are the emerging. Finally, almost done. Uh, how do we implement effectively for the strategy exam? Uh, five key components you should know once again. So set your goals and key success factors. So what do you want to do? How do you measure it? Good. Look at your work breakdown structure. So what do you actually have to do? Make a super comprehensive list if you want, and then group them together or merge the ones that are similar. Next, look at what resources you need to complete all of this work. So you need to get people, you need to get um, materials to build a house, who's involved. And then next, look at how they interlock or um, work together in terms of the people or groups that are at play. So does the IT have to coordinate with marketing to update the website? Is it going to go well? Or is there like a critical dependency that they might screw up? Do you have a risk and contingency for that? And finally, the expected outcome. Can you make a business case justifying why you should do this? By 2032, we're going to have an MPV of about a couple of billion dollars. So I'll send you guys the PDF um, of this slideshow, but you can just paste this in your implementation section, uh, replace the outcomes and metrics, create a basic action plan. Doesn't have to do anything too fancy. If you want to make a table in Excel, I guess you can, but you could just write it out and who, what, uh, what, who, or when for the action plan, basic resource management plan and interlocks. And finally, you can do some financials. So I'll give you some examples. If you really want to be a keener and paste these in or modify it, uh, it's from the Harvard reading. So you can look at how the goals align uh, across your different verticals. You could link them across the levels of hierarchy or depth in your uh, team. So from individual to units or whole corporation, you can look at different performance metrics segmented by the functions of your business. So marketing, manufacturing, HR. You could also define some additional key performance indicators and objectives, linking them together by area. So it could be cost or safety. Uh, this is a different way of writing interlock, but to be honest, you can just use the text version here. Unit A works with B to copy C in this time period. And finally, you can do some basic finances. I really don't think numbers will be big here, Bob. Uh, I think as long as it's there, uh, you'll get them. So yeah, that's all. Thanks for coming to this review session. I'll drop the link to the deck in the chat. See you at the live.